Two years after being dramatically discovered by Sunday night, a treasure trove of previously unknown and candid images of Australian troops went on display at the Australian War Memorial on Friday, thanks to the kind donation of Kerry Stokes. The lost diggers of Vignacourt were discovered in the attic of a French farmhouse, one of the most important World War I finds ever made. Why do you think these images particularly attract people? Why are they different? Because they were unknown. Because they were discovered. There was no history. These images represent the opportunity for hundreds of Australian families to reunite with a legacy, a great legacy they had. And these photos are the key to hundreds of families reuniting again. We found them. This exhibition showcases nearly 100 images selected from Louis and Antoinette Toulier collection. The photographs taken in Vineyard Court, which opened its hearts and its homes to our diggers. They bonded as only good people can bond in really bad times. Vineyard Court was a day's march from hell, but also was for our diggers a refuge from that awful reality. Allez hop! Super! They went to the barn of Louis and Antoinette Toulouet. For the camera, they posed and played up. Like any young Australians today, they put on brave faces. Tragically, most of the photos of many of the men in them never made it home. The flash of the camera was replaced by the flash of cannon the next day. But now they have come home. Their images, perhaps some of their last smiles, did survive. Embedded in the negatives of the day, these were extraordinary Australians. Their lives and bravery, part of our fabric of our country and part of the fabric of our history. They may have been lost, but they'll never be forgotten. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Good evening and welcome to our end of year client event. My name is Spiro Paul. I'm the CEO of Financially Index and Crow Horworth. It's pretty hard to top an event like this evening, so I'm not sure we're ever going to do that. So if your expectations are that, that we've set a bar like this and we're going to beat it next time, we must be disappointed. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce something truly special. I mean, you can see around the room what you may expect to see tonight. But it's my pleasure to welcome a, a special exhibition tonight on the Lost Diggers of Vignancourt. The paintings are by George Petru, and it's a sort of a convoluted story on how it all came to be. And I'll let Ross Coulthard tell you all of that. One such individual who was impacted by those images is a well-known Melbourne graphic designer, George Petru. He's here in the room tonight. Having recently branched out into painting, George's interest in World War I history resulted in him bringing some of the photos from the Lost Diggers to life on canvas, and they are truly inspiring and entrancing if you look around the room. Both George and Ross will share the story with you about the Lost Diggers of Indian Court and the story behind some of the paintings, and each one has a story. And to see Ross tell the story straight off the top of the head with no notes, you can see a man is quite obsessed with his subject. Ross Coulthard has worked as an investigative journalist for over 30 years. He's a well-known face. When you see him, you say, I've seen him somewhere. We all have. He's won five Weekly Journalism Awards, impressive in itself, 
including the top award for Australian journalism, the Gold Walkley, which is, you know, an Oscar. His broadcast television investigative journalism also won a Lundy Award, the Australian Oscar. He's the author of four books. His fifth will be published in 2016 along a similar theme, and he'll tell you about that himself. He has worked for the Sydney Morning Herald, ABC Four Corners, A Current Affair, Nine Network Sunday Program, Channel 7's A Sunday Night, and he's now currently with 60 Minutes. And I'm sure we've all caught all of those programs and his work. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ross to the podium. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much, Spiro. And look, thanks to all of you for coming along tonight. I, um, I'm quite humbled by the, the interest that this whole story has generated. As a journalist, you, you try and predict sometimes. You, know, you do these great stories, you work for months and months and months, and you think, crap, it's just going to be a ripper. And we didn't really predict the response that this one was going to have. And uh, to give you an idea of the response, I'll just show you a quick uh, video that encapsulates the, the response that we've had from all over the world, from, from millions of people. We had 14 million page views on our Facebook site that we set up for the Lost Diggers within three weeks of putting these images up online. And uh, largely through the munificence of um, a wonderful man, Kerry Stokes, the chairman of the Seven Network, who is passionate about Australian military history and passionate about recognising the servicemen and service women, we were able to bring these plates home and, um, and do the research to track down the families. And this was the response we got at the Australian War Memorial when we put the exhibition to there. As Kerry Stokes said there, um, we were all taken aback by the reaction from military historians and uh, people from across the world because what we'd stumbled across was something quite extraordinary. Uh, you have to understand that in the First World War, whereas at Gallipoli men were allowed to take cameras, there's lots of shots of blokes at Gallipoli, on the Western Front, cameras weren't allowed because the trench systems were so secret. They didn't want to show the Germans if they were captured uh, any images of the trench systems. And so it was vitally important that there be nothing that could betray locations and fortifications. It all starts in a little town just north of Amiens, which was uh, uh, about two hours' drive from Paris. And you have to understand, just to give you a bit of a scene set for World War I, World War I, there was quite literally a front line. The Germans had invaded, the Allies had held them back, and there was this stalemate where there were frontline trenches that quite literally dug in all the way from Switzerland right through to the Belgian sea coast. And round right about this time a century ago, there were many young lads on the cliffs of Gallipoli who were preparing for the evacuation from Gallipoli. And uh, in literally um, about a week, on the 19th of December, all of them were evacuated in, in what really was a miracle. The British were predicting a catastrophe, but by brilliant planning, by an Australian staff officer, Brudenell White, they were all evacuated off the Gallipoli Peninsula, and um, they all knew that this was the moment when the decision was made to send them to the Western Front. And they had no idea what they were going into, but they knew it was a completely different kind of war from what they'd been in. Gallipoli was close quarters, you could see, you could even smell the enemy at times. But when they got there, the British had been in the area of Vinyakor, this little rest town, for uh, about a year. And they'd realised that trench warfare on the Western Front was so intense, it was so bloody horrible, that you could only stay in a trench for about eight days. Eight days was about the maximum before you just went completely nuts. And rather than putting men up against a wall and shooting them, as they did a lot of them, uh, because they just couldn't fight anymore, they gave them rest areas. And they made them rest areas so that were an easy march out of the front line. And so here you've got the front lines here. And um, they marched them into a little town called Vinyakor, which you won't be able to read here, but it's just there. And uh, that town was one of the places where you could get a hot bath, a new uniform, and uh, basically drink a lot of wine, bounce a pretty girl on your knee, and, and have a ball. I was trying to think of a theme for tonight, and I was trying to think of, we've got 
so many incredibly brave people in the audience, people who've done acts of enormous courage. And it's going to be a wonderful thing to pay tribute to those people later on. But I think in their own way, they'd recognize what I'm about to say, which is we mythologize courage sometimes. We talk about people who have unique qualities of courage. But really what the First World War was all about, it's not to glorify war, it's not to say, you know, rah, rah, didn't we do well? It's to basically acknowledge that there were perfectly ordinary young men, and indeed women, who were put into an extraordinary situation where they really had to find the best in themselves. And uh, there's a great quote that I, it always moves me. A British officer wrote, of, of the Somme, the 1st of July 1916 was an utter cataclysm for the Allies, for Australia. It was the beginning of the Battle of the Somme that raged for four months. And this is what the Australians were being brought in for. In May of 1916, they were brought in and um, uh, basically uh, trained up for the process of what was intended to be a massive attack on the German lines, to break through and go all the way through to Berlin. And a British officer wrote, Never before in our history had such an army been gathered, and never again would an army, such an army be seen. The very flower of a race can bloom but once in a generation. The flower of our generation bloomed and perished during the first four months of the first battle of the Somme. We shall not look upon their like again. And I just find those words incredible because they really encapsulate what you're about to see. There was a photographer called Louis Tullier in this village called Vignacourt. He'd been a dispatch writer and he had a hobby. He liked taking photographs. And it just so happened he had what was even then an old fashioned glass plate negative camera. But he realized it could take photographs at a far better quality than the existing box brownie cameras, which had a kind of a curve in the focal plane at the back because the film bent. And so the photos were often very foggy and blurry. And here his beautiful wife Antoinette realized they, they could make a bob or two or a franc or two out of selling photographs to the passing troops. And the Aussies turned up in 1916. It's quite funny actually because you've got all these stiff photographs of the Brits and they're all sort of posing like this and the Aussies are all like this, you know. They're, they're all getting raucous drunk. And to me, there's a lot that this photograph says. It's actually taken a bit later in the war, but I always use it at this point because it encapsulates what happened. These guys, when they enlisted in Australia, they swore an allegiance to the king, to the empire. They didn't swear an allegiance to Australia. They didn't think of themselves as Australians. They thought of themselves as Brits. But something happened in the First World War, and I don't think it happened on Gallipoli. I actually think we've sold a, a bit of a pump on Gallipoli, to be perfectly honest. I don't want to detract from the, the heroism, the, the sacrifice, the, the incredible effort that was made to try and secure the Dardanelles, but let's be frank about it. We lost. We were defeated. The Turks beat us. But what happened on the Western Front, what that surviving corps of men went on to achieve on the Western Front was absolutely extraordinary. And at this point, these chaps have just survived the war. It's just before the armistice. And uh, they're sending a message home, you know, we want our mummies. <laughs> but what I particularly love is they'd signed up as Brits, but this chap and this chap had cut little maps of Australia out of bully beef tins and they've made them into jewellery emblems that they would put on their arms. By this stage of the war, they thought of themselves as Australian. They were fiercely proud of the fact that they were different from these bloody Brits, as they called them. They knew they were different. They were more informal, they were more casual, they had a sense of humour, and they were bloody good soldiers. They were the best stormtroopers on the Western Front, because the guys who'd been through Gallipoli, who survived by 1918, were formidable soldiers, and even the British acknowledged that. The British were there as well, and uh, what these photos show is a, another side to soldiering. This was the place where you could just come and cut loose and get fiercely drunk. There's a, there's a second photograph in this series where one of the guys is almost lying on the floor. <laughs> but um, the French were there. Uh, and to give you an idea of the quality of these negatives, the, um, you can actually read this message when it's on high res. And he's sending a message to his beautiful wife and little daughter. And as far as we know, this gentleman didn't survive. He was part of the French advance that was there well before the Australians and the Brits got there in 1914, and he was sent forward. 
And the, the uniform that he was wearing was actually a very bright blue, and they had red seams in their trousers, and uh, the Germans could see them from a mile away, and they were picked off. And it says so much about the 19th century technology and uniform and procedures that they had for fighting the war, because what they didn't realize was that they were going into a, a completely different type of warfare. The world had never seen anything like it. The machine gun had been developed. Uh, artillery fire had been developed to an extent where it could basically demolish a battlefield. And they were using 19th century techniques that had been honed during the American Civil War of marching men across open plains. They didn't know anything about enfilading crossfire of machine guns. They didn't know anything about targeting artillery. And they got slaughtered. They got absolutely slaughtered. And the Australians turned up, and there was a, a British journalist called Philip Gibbs who was immediately awestruck by them because we really had seen the flower of our manhood. Only the fittest and the best and the strongest were sent. And that was the tragedy. Because early in the war, there were so many Australians who were clamouring to join up that we sent our sportsmen, we sent the cream of our profession. And Philip Gibbs wrote, I liked the look of the Australians. They were hard as steel and finely tempered. Among them were boys of more delicate fibre and sensitive, if one might judge by their clean-cut features and wistful eyes. But the Aussies came into this little village where the civilians had also been photographed by the Tullier. And how did we find these pictures? That's the big question I'm always being asked. We'd heard a, a rumour that there was a collection. Uh, we knew that somebody, and we've never found them, somebody was selling individual plates on eBay. And there was a distinctive backdrop I'll show you later, a canvas painted backdrop that is like a fingerprint for these plates. And they're so beautifully shot, these plates. You can always tell a Tullier photograph. And they were appearing on eBay. Somebody was flogging them from the hiding place and uh, selling them on the uh, internet. We never found that person. But I uh, met a historian called Laurent Maruse, and uh, he told me he had a bit of a lead. He told me after we'd been looking for six months or so and we'd tried numerous blind alleys, but Laurent took me to this little village called Vignacourt, and he took me to this town hall where he'd seen some images years earlier. And there were a dozen of these images on the wall. And so we knew that there were Tulliers somewhere in this town. And so we quite literally went knocking. And we found this woman, a, a, a Madame Cronier, whose husband, uh, Robert, had been the local photographer. And uh, the French, God bless them, they're notorious hoarders. They don't throw anything away. And uh, this lovely lady, her husband had died about 20 years earlier, and she had no idea anything at all about the photographs. She didn't even know much about it. But I, I wish I could show you that just behind Laurent's shoulder here, that on this wall, there's a little porcelain map of Australia. And she saw me looking at it. And I, I said, oh, Australia. Australia, you know, to call Australia. And she leaned across to me and she said, N'oubliez pas jamais les Australiens. Never forget the Australians. And I think she decided at that moment she was going to trust us because she had a secret. And she left the room and I thought, oh, crikey, I've upset her. And um, it was clear she knew something. But she came back with this ammunition case, a World War II ammunition case that was full of glass plates. And then we knew that we were on the trail of something interesting. But she didn't have the collection. And so we had to do all these land title searches and find the Tullier houses and track down members of the Tullier family because they'd all left the area. And finally, after weeks of looking, we found um, a lawyer called Christian Tullier in the Havre up on the coast. And we brought him down and he didn't really want to help us, but he said, there's nothing there. He said, there's just an empty family home, but he said, you'll find nothing there. And sure enough, we walked in the front door of this house here and wandered through this floor and then through this floor and we were about to give up. And then I said, what about the attic? And he went, oh, it's just full of, he, I, I speak French, so you know, he said in French, it's just full of crap, you know, just, you know, not worth it. And we went up to this attic and it was like packed with um, French cycling magazines and uh, unbelievably about 300 World War II jerry cans because the Nazis had come through in World War II and the French can't help themselves. They sort of go to the battlefield. It was like an archaeological remnant because we peeled back the uh, World War II jerry cans, the, the uh, 1930s French cycling magazines, 
um, baby carriages, old furniture. And then we just really couldn't believe this. And I, I often say I, I think we were mystically led because the bosses were screaming, saying, where are you, Roscoe? You know, <laughs> you know, come home. It's come and do a real story. Anyway, it turned out that Robert Cronier, who'd passed away, he'd had access to this collection in the 1980s. And um, it had been put away back in the attic by the family and forgotten about. And all the surviving family members who knew anything about it, they'd passed away themselves. Nobody knew it was there. And so Laurent and I, the historian, just started lifting all these heavy packages and Peter Burness from the Australian War Memorial who we'd taken across. I'm thinking, gosh, if we wasted our time. And then all of a sudden we go up these stairs and uh, this is my family when we came to visit. We go up these stairs and in a last ditch effort we walk through this room here into the attic that's at the front of the house under those skylights that I showed you earlier. And um, in this attic, beautiful French girl, always meet the French girl, um, in this attic after we'd lifted all of the jerry cans we found these three treasure chests for heaven's sake. I mean, how many times as a journalist do you get to find treasure? This was real treasure because when we opened these beautiful chests, we found 4,000, 5,000 glass plates. And remember, this is 100 years. It was 97 years that they'd been sitting in this attic, forgotten about. And they'd had freezing cold French winters, you know, stifling hot French summers. And they'd all been wrapped in newspaper and cardboard boxes. And miraculously, that was exactly the sort of insulation you needed to protect the emulsion, the uh, silver nitrate emulsion on the glass plates. And we held them up to the light, and Peter Burness immediately went, well, that's an Anzac. And then we knew we'd discovered something absolutely miraculous, because all of these photographs, almost all of them, had disappeared. Because the technology that the Tuliers used was called POP. It was a, a very quick way of developing a photograph in the field, where you, you took the, the slide, you took the glass plate, held it up to a bit of um, uh, photographic sensitive paper, and then just gave it to the person. And it would fade after a while. And unless they sent it back to Australia and it was recopied, re-photographed, after a while, all people would have in their collections back in Australia was just a little bit of cardboard. And time and time again, I get phone calls from people who say, I think I've got a Tulier. I can just make out an image. And it's faded after 100 years. And so we realized when we put these on a scanner, these were incredible images. We could generate... 120 megabyte size files. We could, we could actually look into the images and better still, we discovered the canvas backdrop that they'd been photographed in front of. This big canvas backdrop is now in the War Memorial and you can be photographed in front of it. And that was our fingerprint. That was when we knew we had a Tullier. And so the task we then gave ourselves was to find the lost diggers. And the reaction we had, we, we made a Facebook page called The Lost Diggers. It's still there. And we made some documentaries called The Lost Diggers for the Seven Network. They're still online if you want to watch them. We were just devastated by the volume of responses. The Channel Switch, 7 switch went into meltdown. You know, We couldn't get calls in or out. It struck a, an emotional chord with people because I think, as you can hear, you can stare into the eyes of these young men. And, you know, these are lovely young lads. This fellow here is... Um, a military medal winner. You can tell that from his ribbon. And after the family saw this on telly, they realized that it was a photograph of Sidney Hubert Carroll, whose family run a, a real estate agency, uh, Leahy Real Estate in um, Mos Mosman. And they're quite a famous real estate company. And uh, he, he survived the war, mercifully, but so many of these young men didn't. And that's the incredible thing, is that what these photographs record largely is a period of history just before the Battle of the Somme, which was a cataclysm, an absolute disaster. 20,000 British troops died on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. 20,000 British troops. So when the Australians were brought in, they weren't in the actual first day, but they were in a preliminary battle called Fromel that I'll take you to in a moment, which is our own epic military disaster. But they immediately cut a different sway of the Aussies. You know, they were... The French loved them. They still talk about them. It's part of the mythology of the town that the Australians were so humorous and uh, fun-loving. But to me, this encapsulates everything about it. You've got the stiff-looking Frenchman who looks ever so slightly uncomfortable with these Aussies who've all got ciggies in their mouth. But 
Well, this is this is the uh, this is the winter of 1916, which is one of the coldest winters on record in France. Bitterly, bitterly cold, and the only way they could keep alive in the trenches was to wear these animal skins. But they were la lied with um, louse. They were full of lice, and the men would um, take them off and run their their cigarette lighters or their matches through the seams to try and kill the lice. But no matter what they did, the lice would still hatch and come back, and they'd be forever itching like this. And all the letters back home describe this incredible wound that they all had, where they were sort of scarring themselves with the uh, the, the agony of itching themselves. And um, I'll take you to a few of the stories, because some of the stories are just absolutely magnificent. The, this is one of our favourites, and it's one of the first slides we pulled out of the box. Um, the guy sitting bottom right is one of our most decorated war heroes, Joe Maxwell, VC. He, um, well, he won a, a DCM earlier in the war because um, he was about to go into battle, and uh, he noticed that an Australian tank had just been hit. And so he just casually jumped onto the burning tank, knowing that at any second it could explode, opened the lid of the tank, got the men out, and then casually, after he'd rescued those guys, ran back and helped his men and went into battle and won the battle. And he was this incredible soldier who, quite frankly, was hopeless in civilian life. He was a gardener for the Department of Veterans Affairs for a large part of his life because he just couldn't cope like a lot of these blokes couldn't. He couldn't cope with the magnitude of what he'd been through and then coming back into civilian life. But Joe uh, won his VC on the Hindenburg Line, the great breach that took them through the German lines in 1918. And the way he did it was just extraordinary. He, uh, in complete defiance of machine gun fire and artillery fire, the uh, men that he was sending to get through this wire couldn't get through it. And they were all trying to cut the wire. They were standing there trying to cut the wire. And of course, as they're standing there, they're getting shot and cut down by German snipers. So Joe, and the description is just breathtaking about what he did. He grabbed a rifle, jumped on top of the wire and ran along the wire under fire, shooting as he went and took out the machine gun crew that were actually shooting at them, and then led the attack and broke the lines. It was quite an extraordinary achievement. But each of these men has a story, and the, the lovely thing about it, and the personal thing for me, is we've learned, the way we've identified them, is you learn to read their uniforms. My wife has become a World War One nerd. She goes, well, that's a 1916 tunic, you know, because it has this cut here. Um, the, the cap's a, a particular cut of cap. But all of these guys did extraordinary things. This chap, John Doyle, his sister lived in Randwick in Sydney, and um, I live in Randwick, so I went and had a look at the family home where they'd lived. And she, there's these wretchedly sad letters on the file where she's tormented because she's heard that her brother's been seriously injured. And look, he survived, but he wasn't a well man when he came back to Australia. And like so many of these guys, they gave so much. And to be able to bring their stories alive, the National Archives, I really commend it to you. They've got these extraordinary archives of personnel records where once you have a name or a service number, you can basically call up digitally anybody who served in the First World War in Australia's file. And, and you can tell their story in minute detail, detailing exactly what happened to them. <laughs> Even embarrassingly, whether they got VD when they were in Alexandria. And a lot of them did. Um, this is our pin-up boy, Jim Holland, who, quite frankly, we, we love because he's a stud. You know, he's a big, handsome guy who was a machine gunner in the First World War. And uh, when we put this particular photograph to air, we didn't know who he was. And uh, within a day or so, we had a call from a very famous Australian actress called Val Lehman, who was a, a famous actress in The, uh, the Prisoner, the, uh, the Prisoner Program. And Val said, uh, that's my great uncle. And... Uh, it so turned out that uh, Jim's son and daughter, Kath and Reg, were turning 93 the week that we discovered who he was. And they'd never seen this image. Um, Jim might have sent it home, but as I explained earlier, the image had probably faded. So the family had never seen this image. And so we uh, uh, decided to fly to Perth with a full film crew, and we got two big blow-ups framed of the particular image here and took them across, wrapped them in brown paper, and gave them to Kath and Reg at, the, um, at their birthday party. And they didn't know who we were. It was quite funny. And we uh, presented them to them on camera. And uh, they're sort of wondering who these interlopers are that have barged into their birthday party. And 
it costs a lot of money to fly a film crew across a country, so you've got to make sure you're right. And we weren't 100% right that it was Jim. We only had Val's ID. And there's this dreadful pause because Kath, 93 years old, she's looking at the photograph that she's unwrapped and she's really puzzled. And I, I can feel the ground opening up beneath me thinking I've flown all this way. And then um, she just tips her head back and sobs and goes, it's a photograph of Papa. And she bursts into tears and we all burst into tears with relief, quite frankly. <laughs> um, this is a lovely story and it, it tells the story of, of what is Australia's biggest military catastrophe, Fromel. Fromel was a battle that was intended as a diversion uh, just before the Battle of the Somme. There was a, an Australian attack um, further north of where the Battle of the Somme was to be launched and it was intended to draw the German forces away from where the Allies would be breaching for their primary attack. Uh, both that intended feint was a complete disaster, but it was also a disaster for the 5,533 young Australians who were either killed or wounded uh, in a, um, an area of ground that really truly is not much larger than probably a half a dozen tennis courts. Uh, they were slaughtered. They were told by the British commander to advance, notwithstanding that um, his own staff officers, an Australian staff officer called Pompey Elliott, who was the commander of the Australian forces, had basically advised against the attack, saying that it would be a bloody holocaust. And it was. It was dreadful. But one of the ones who went over was Frank, Frank Aitchison. And it really brings it home to you when you actually meet people like Frank's son, Sam. Sam's now in his 90s himself, and uh, he lives in Adelaide. And it's the proudest moment of his life when he was watching telly and he saw his dad's face come up on television. We didn't know who Frank was, but he rings us and he says, that's my dad. And Frank had been a serviceman in World War II and uh, he sent us photographs and uh, service records that confirmed the ID. And he even had memories of what his father had told him about Fromel. He talked about how when they went across and Fromel you could throw a hat up and it would come down riddled with bullets. Uh, it was just dreadful. And Frank, mercifully, was one of those who survived. He was in a, a second wave that got struck down fairly late in the piece and were basically told to retreat. But Charles Bean, who I've written a book about, the official historian, he went back to the Fromel battlefield on the day of the armistice because it was the one battle that he knew nothing about because it had been under constant uh, German fire all through the war and on the very last day of the war Bean went back to the Fromel battlefield and it's so wretchedly sad because the young men when they were machine guns they were advancing across open land and they were told to walk. Imagine that, you've got a single bolt action rifle, you're walking across and you're just hit with machine gun fire right here, right through your groin. And the idea is that you'd bleed out slowly. That was deliberately intended to wound you, not to kill you and to bring other men out so that they would um, get killed in the process of trying to rescue you, and many of them did. And Bean found a whole lot of these wounded men who couldn't walk off the battlefield. They were never able to be rescued. And the lowest point of the battlefield, he found heaps of bones and skeletons and water bottles. And at this point in the battlefield where there was water, all these young men had gathered to die. It was the most horrific thing. And it remains our biggest military disaster. It should never have happened. And for the Australians, it was a real lesson. Fromel and Pozier were turning points in the war for the Aussies. They'd always respected the British generals up till then, even through Gallipoli when they made some ridiculous decisions. But Fromel and Pozier were real turning points because they realised that these British commanders had no idea. They really had no idea. And neither did some of the Australian commanders. Um, these two men uh, on the far right, Clary Aspinall and uh, Clary Fraser, I've put this photo in just for a bit of good news after all that misery because they were in Fromel as well, but they survived. And this is uh, Clary Aspinall's wedding a few years after the war ended. Cheer up, everybody. Um, anyway, the, uh, the battle of Pozier, which, um, which happened very soon after Fromel, was uh, uh, utter misery. And... Uh, Two of the men who went through it were, were this man, the chaplain, a Catholic chaplain, James Gilbert, and uh, a doctor, Keith Doy. And uh, I didn't really know a lot about the history of 
Catholics and Protestants and the enmity that existed back then at the turn of last century, but apparently they didn't get on too well. And um, it was a unique thing for a Catholic to be so friendly with a Protestant. Uh, but there's some incredible letters that I, I put in the book where Keith wrote back to his, his engaged fiance and uh, basically said, look, you know, to stay warm on the battlefield of Pozier, I'm, I'm literally hugging this Catholic priest who's become one of my best friends. And these two men helped each other through the war. And it's so moving. It's an incredible thing. I, and just coming back to that theme that I was talking about, I, I think what the men that you're about to meet tonight, who did the Cross of Valor Act, um, was an extraordinary act of courage. But it was also an extraordinary act of courage just to turn up for this war. Because as you read the horrific things that these guys went through and how little was being communicated back home to the Australian public, which is my obsession as a journalist, just how poorly the public was served with the information they were given back home. It's outrageous the lies that were told to the Australian public about how successful the war was, how well we were doing. Because quite frankly, 1915, 1916, and even 1917, the war was going against us. It was going very, very badly. And it was men like these who at the end of 1917 and into 1918, when the Germans made a massive push, Falkenhayn's big advance, this is when I think we should commemorate our history. I think we're hopelessly hung up on Gallipoli, not to detract from the heroism or the sacrifice there, but what happened in 1918 with Australians was just phenomenal. And I, I have to admit, I didn't really realise this until I wrote a book about Charles Bean, who was there, who witnessed it all. And there are moments in April, May of 1918 when the British Army is in full retreat. And it's in their records. They brought in young men, boys, who had no idea of combat. They've lost a lot of their combat people by that stage of the war. They were gutted. They couldn't possibly hold the lines. And the Germans were pushing through with stormtroopers they'd brought in because the Russians had, had folded in the Bolshevik re revolution and abandoned the war. And so there was this ridiculous situation where there were millions of Germans pushing on the Allied lines and rushing up to fill the gap. And Bean describes this. He's an Amiens, that town I showed you earlier. And they're all rushing up to a place called Albert, where the front line is. And there's an incredible line he's got where he says that these had, they, they had the look on their faces of men who, been, who knew they were going to their deaths. And then he noticed that they had a black A on their shoulders. And they were the Anzacs. They were the Gallipoli guys. That means they'd served in Gallipoli. And they were the strongest, the best troops. And they went up to a place called Villa Bretonneux. And by God, they held the line. And it was an incredible battle where one of the last massed bayonet charges in history in the dead of night, they retook Villa Bretonneux in an act of just insane courage. And some of the men that were there was um, Lieutenant Harold Griffiths, who was killed during the battle and uh, so loved by his men that he was carried off on their shoulders on a stretcher and the Germans held their fire because they could see that this was a ma matter of you know, great sadness for the soldiers. They weren't a threat. And at considerable peril and risk for themselves, they, they basically carried their officer off the battlefield. And what that was and what the Australians had discovered and what kept them alive was mateship. Acts of courage for your mates. It's as simple as that. And another one of the guys here was a, a guy called um, Les Macon. And uh, part of the tragedy for, for Les is that, um, you know, he was the much-loved son of a very wealthy and uh, respected Melbourne family, and uh, he'd joined up in the zeal and passion of um, 1915, served in Gallipoli, almost made it right through the war. And then in the battle, he got his leg blown off, the, the leg that's actually closest to us. And uh, you read the medical records of how they, they struggled to try and keep him alive, but back then, there were no antibiotics. And it was almost inevitable with the incredibly fertile soil of the Somme. It was full of feces from animals and uh, bacteria. Uh, it always got infected. And the, the thing that killed most soldiers was rampaging infection with the absence of antibiotics. And Les died a terrible death from gas gangrene. His body basically rotted. And uh, it's interesting because 
I have a theory about the First World War. It's certainly in my family. My grandfather was a cavalry officer, and he was terribly affected by it. And I think it affected my father in, in some ways. It certainly affected my family because there's this legacy of sadness, and it certainly is the case in Les's family. It's taken a hundred years for the sadness to turn into what I think the lost diggers aroused, which is pride. And my theory is, is that a hundred years on, we've finally come to terms with the enormity of the grief of what these men went through, and people can now celebrate. They can celebrate stories like Joe Wood. Joe was a character. Everybody says he, um, he loved to joke. His personnel file is full of AWL, absent without leave, um, you know, getting the clap in Alexandria brothels um, and being punished for doing that. And uh, he was a real character, but he got his leg blown off in the war. And uh, he didn't let it affect him. Uh, he was, uh, his family uh, rang us in great pride saying, you've got a photograph of dad in the Tullier collection. And uh, he was a, a Lithgow guy. And this is him after the war with a big beaming smile on his face. And his family say he was like that all his life. But the one thing they also say is that he never spoke about the war. Never spoke about the war. Never talked or imparted about what he'd been through. And when you read his file, you go, oh my God, because he went through the most horrific fighting. But he never talked about it. He, he, um, he kept it to himself like they all did. There's a great uh, book called Birdsong by uh, Sebastian Fawkes. And um, uh, they write of how you know, they will leave this place, the trenches, and they will never speak of what they've seen. And that's what they did. They didn't speak of it. They came home. They were told to forget about it and get on with it. But so many of these men, Joe Cope, but so many of these men came back and lived with a mental scar, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, we call it these days. And I was talking to Alan Sparks, who's one of the Cross of Valor winners, and uh, we were talking earlier about the mental pain that these guys went through. And uh, there were so many suicides. There were more men suicided after World War I than there were killed during the war from Australia. It was terrible. They couldn't live with what they'd remembered. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude, I mean, um, without going into huge detail because I'm conscious of time, uh, Herbert Foxton, um, he was in one of the great battles uh, towards the end of 1917. And handsome young lad, there's the most horrific images of what his face looked like after he'd been shot. He got hit with a, a round in this side of his face and it literally blew his entire right-hand side of his face off. And he was one of the very early recipients of um, plastic surgery by a Kiwi surgeon called Gillies in England. And they rebuilt his face. And um, he survived, but uh, Cess Ortoloni b beside him, I mean, that's the Anzac, eh? You can't, you can't see it on him here, but there's an Anzac A on his shoulder. These guys were Anzacs. They'd served in Gallipoli. They had every right to expect that, you know, at some stage they'd be given a break, but they served right throughout the war. And they did it so honorably, such an act of courage for them just to turn up and keep on turning up. But Cess was an extraordinary officer, and he knew his odds weren't good. If you were an officer in the Somme, at the key battles of the Somme, you had a life expectancy at one stage of two and a half weeks if you were a captain. And uh, he didn't make it. But the real tragedy is, neither did he and his brothers. Two of his brothers died on Gallipoli, uh, Bert and Viv. And um, I just find it incredible. I mean, I'm, I've met members of the family. Nobody can recall really much about this family because the family was annihilated. It ceased to exist at this point. Must have been a terrible thing for a mother to come to terms with the fact that you know, essentially, that's it. It's all over. I mean, we've all seen Saving Private Ryan in World War II. This is why they worried about things like that. Families were quite literally destroyed, brought to an end as a result of this dreadful war. One of the other things I, I didn't know about until I did the research on this, we started finding images of men of color in the plates. And one of the great myths, even in the registration papers, you had to certify that you were a white Englishman, a white Briton. It was appallingly racist. And uh, people of colour were not allowed at the early stages of the war to enlist. And there was a push on for conscription in Australia and the public voted it back. Most notably the soldiers on the Western Front voted it back because they didn't want to bring people over who didn't want to be there. They didn't want anybody else to share the horror of this experience. And so men of colour, the firstly New Zealand's Maori started going across and they were welcomed. They were formidable at Gallipoli. They did the haka at Gallipoli and scared the pajabas out of the Turks. 
Aboriginal people started going. And we don't quite know how many people went from Aboriginal communities because there's no record of it. There's no record of it at all. It was suppressed. And in fact, the fiction was preserved uh, when Aboriginal people enlisted. The fiction was preserved that they were white. They were given the title half white. And um, we don't know who this young man is, the Aboriginal man, but we, we, we've just identified this lad and uh, he died, sadly. But um, there are probably about four, five hundred Aboriginal men who served, and many of them were decorated. Many of them won very high honours. And yet, when they came back to Australia, they weren't allowed to have a drink in a pub. And uh, this man's family told us the story recently of how when um, Aboriginal workers who'd worked on the family farm came back to WA, they took one of the Aboriginal men into a pub and they were kicked out. They were told an Aboriginal black person can't, can't drink in this pub. And they tried to explain that he's a serviceman, he served this country, and he wasn't allowed in. And they also weren't allowed to own land either. And that was the situation in this country until the 1960s, incredibly. I find that amazing. Um, this is one of my favourite stories, and you'll, you'll see why a, a little later as well. But uh, we call this young lad the sad-eyed digger. And we were really puzzled as to who he was. We found this image in the um, French National Museum in Peron, and that's, that's him again. And he always had this incredibly sad look on his face. And unfortunately, his name wasn't on this photograph, but this gave us a key clue. And we had to use all our skills as a journalist to basically try and find, um, try and find uh, any of the men in this image to see if we could contact their families. And I was putting H.A. Partons into the uh, National Archives search machine. And uh, it turned out, I think there's about half a dozen of them. And I finally found the son of a guy called Horace Parton who's this guy here. And Horace had written letters home to, to his son, Trevor, who's now an elderly man in the Dandenongs. And these letters gave enough information for us to identify the young man on the far right as George Gordon Gilbert, the sad-eyed digger. And we were then able to get his file and uh, adduce that he was a very young man. He was, in fact, a child when he enlisted. He was uh, 16, 17 years old. And he died. He just turned 18 when he died. And um, we're still trying to find his family because he'd only been in Australia for a few months. And I'm now liaising with British newspapers in um, Yorkshire. We've had his image in different newspapers across England, trying to find any members of his family who might still be alive. Because uh, the thing we've realised is it matters. It, I, I've, I've lost count of the number of times I've knocked on a door and I've said, look, I've got a photograph of your grandfather or your great-grandfather, and people go, look, I'm sorry, he died in the war. You know, you know, there's no photographs. And I go, look, I promise you, I, I, I know I've got a photograph. And uh, time and time again, people say to us, we never spoke about the war, and we, we, you know, and we don't know anything about what happened in the war, and we can bring this to life because we've been able to identify these people. And one of them is um, Angus Wilson, who was a... Uh, a decorated young soldier, and uh, I, I just love this image because it says so much about the casual way the Australians behaved. They, uh, this was taken fairly late in the war, and by that stage of the war, they knew they were damn good. They knew they were really good. And um, they were mates. They looked out for each other. And uh, this is getting pretty close towards Armistice Day, and these blokes had survived. And you can see it in their faces. There's almost a risk. But what I really love about Angus's face, and you can see... Um, George, there's an image of him here, isn't there? And you've rendered a beautiful um, image of Angus there. He's just got that cocksure look about himself. He knows he's good. And that's what, that's what the French talked about. Um, when, um, when we were in Vignacourt, um, we met French people who'd been alive, uh, not during the war, sadly, but there were young people who, um, who remembered mum and dad talking about the Australians. And they were legendary. You know, pas jamais les Australians. They never wanted to forget the Australians. They were. Um, I seem to have run out of battery power. Can you just forward the slide for me, Mike? Um, the um, this image. I'll take you on to the next one. If you flick on to the next image, please. Have a look at this bloke here. See those eyes? That's the classic thousand-yard stare. That's what men look like when they've been under artillery fire. Can you go to the next image, please? I'll try again. Ah, 
it's working again. Um, he's got that startled look. Time and time again in the images you see this. And the experts tell us that's what men look like when they've been under shell fire for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I'm pretty sure from the type of uniform this guy's wearing that this is just after the Battle of Pozier. And if you've never read any of the books about Pozier, I really commend it to you because the town of Pozier was a beautiful little French village. But as Peter Burness, the World War I historian we took with us, I said, where is the old town? And he says, you're standing on it. And he said it was annihilated. It was ground into brick dust by the bombing from both sides. And I said, well, where were the Aussie trenches? And he says, there were none, really. They were just shell holes. And for months and months and months, people like this man squatted in shell holes, trying forlornly to take positions like the windmill. And if you ever go to Pozier, if any of you have got a military background, you'll know how difficult it is to advance across open land with artillery fire and machine gun fire cutting you to bits. And that's what it was like on Pozier. It's flat like a billiard table. And the only thing they could do was just walk across and hope like bloody hell they weren't hit. And so many thousands and thousands of young Australians gave their lives. There's a great line from Charles Bean that the... Um, actually, no, it's Philip Gibbs, the British journalist, and he says that the, the fields of Pozier are more densely sown with Australian sacrifice and blood than any other place on earth. And men like this came out of that battle and they had that incredible thousand of large steer and so we're trying to find them. And so one of the clues we used was we looked at his lapel and we could see that he had a military medal. And unfortunately, there's so many men in that battalion, particular battalion. And at the moment, we're, we're still chasing it, but we discovered there's a little dot in the middle of the military medal, and that tells us that he's got a bar. He's got two military medals. So there's two, there's eight blokes in that battalion who've got these uh, military medals. So we may, in fact, be able to give this guy a name, which would be a wonderful thing. I, I dream of being able to knock on a door and say, I've got a photograph of your great granddad. No, sorry, he died in the war, or he, he never talked about the war. Maybe one day we'll be able to give it to them. And when, you, when they see these images, they're, 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 they're really happy. These are the sort of images you just see. Um, th that's the thing that I find really interesting is they didn't take these photographs to send back home. They took them for their mates. And a lot of these guys couldn't read. And so when you look at the personal effects of men who've died in battle, a lot of them, the personal effects describe them having sheaves of photographs in their breast pockets. And that's how they keep track of all their mates. And um, it's quite tragic because a lot of the photographs, they look bloody miserable. And all they're doing is reflecting what they were going through. A couple of Gordon Highlanders, I just love that image because I'm a Scotsman. Um, uh, there's, um, the, all through the war, the, the British were there. It was a big encampment and um, everybody's sending messages back home, reassuring messages. These guys are uh, wearing flying jackets. They were um, probably flying softwood camels out of the nearby British air base. Um, there were Gurkhas. Nepalese Gurkhas, formidable soldiers. There's a great story that Charles Bean tells about how one of the Gurkhas went mad in battle and uh, uh, the, uh, the Allies were more worried that this mad Gurkha with his kukri was going to come and cut their throats than they were about the Germans and the orders was given to, <laughs> to keep this Gurkha on site because he'd gone completely staff raving mad. Um, there's some beautiful shots of the Tullier children. We actually met the son of this guy, uh, and uh, it was quite beautiful to be able to show in this image. Um, Indian Sikhs, they fought with great distinction, by the way, in, um, in the Somme. Big, gigantic men. Um, there were Chinese labor corps workers who came all the way from China and uh, uh, at considerable peril retrieved bodies and wounded people off the battlefield. They dug graves. They, were, they did a lot of the terrible jobs. And um, it's been a real privilege to make contact with the Chinese government who wants to see a lot of these images and put them on display. They're uh, very excited to, to know that this period of history was recorded. Um, we actually did a story on Chinese television, which was my highest rating story ever. It was watched by six million Chinese people. <laughs> this, this is one of my favorite images, and it's actually of a British regiment. Um, these are the command headquarters uh, officers from the 6th West Yorkshires. And um, uh, they've, uh, we can actually tell the story of every single man in this image. And, uh, you know, for example, we know that this guy died. Um, this guy's the Reverend. He survived. 
This guy was the doctor. I spoke to his son recently. He was so proud of his daddy. This guy was terribly wounded. He was blown off his horse just before the first day of the Battle of the Somme. This guy died. This guy died. We don't know what happened to this bloke. But if you look at their eyes, look at those bloody eyes. They've just come out of Tietval. Tietval was a, a position on the Somme where, in an act of utter lunacy, General Haking, the British commander, ordered the British to dig trenches underneath British fortification, sorry, German fortifications that were higher than theirs. So not only did the Germans have a visual reference onto the British positions and they could see anything, they could drop shells on them at any time. And so they'd just come out of the Battle of Thietval and they were hammered. And then they had to go back into that battle on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And we can actually, we know exactly what happened. You know, um, this chap was sitting on his horse and uh, they were in a forest hiding, but the Germans had seen them and the Germans started shelling the trees above them. And when you hit a tree with shell fire, it turns splinters into bullets. And men were just mown down out of about a thousand men, 800 fell before they even marched out of the trench. And then when they advanced, they were just cut down by the Germans because they'd been able to reference every point of the battlefield and they could lock machine guns into crossfire. And these poor chaps were literally cut down. The, the battalion history describes how they fell in perfect rows, in serried rows. And on that very first day of the Battle of the Somme, I think I've said it already, but I'll just say it again because I find it such an enormous number. 20,000 British troops died. And yet the British newspapers said it was a magnificent advance and a wonderful victory. The public was lied to terribly right through the First World War. And as, as a journalist, that's one of the things that most irks me. I promise you we're almost at an end here. This is the Armistice Day. This is one of the only known photographs, but again, Le Tullier's talk of the very moment of 11 a.m. on the 11th of the 11th, 1918. And this is in the Vignacourt Town Square. And the Australian 5th Division's gathered in the Town Square, and they're looking up at the, um, the Vignacourt Cathedral. And Joe Maxwell, the VC winner I told you about earlier, they had a merry party, and he, he describes how everybody went mad with the strain, with the joy opened up the estaminets and had a wild party. And Joe ended up at the uh, Folie Bergère. He hopped on a truck and went down to Paris and ended up on the stage of the Folie Bergère in, in uh, Montmartre in uh, Paris. And literally, the uh, battalion diary describes him doing the can-can with the can-can girls in Paris. But uh, at the exact moment, you, you saw those chaps looking up before. This is what they're looking up at. At the exact moment of the armistice, two brave Aussies had climbed to the steeple and they launched the tricolour, the French national flag, and the Australian national flag. And this is just the moment before the Australian national flag was waved. And they got their butts kicked because they shouldn't have had the Australian flag flying higher than the, Australia, the French flag. And they were put in the stocks and punished for a few weeks for what they'd done. But uh, it's a beautiful story because nobody, this, because there were no cameras, there's very, very little history of what actually happened on Armistice Day. That's why this is so special. And this is the most touching thing, because the villagers remember this. I've met children who remember this moment. Three, four, five days after the, uh, the armistice, they all go down to the cemetery, where all the Australians and the Brits and the other allies are buried. And the French general stands at attention, and he honours the Australians as the bravest of the brave. And he pays tribute to what they've done here. And by golly, they've never forgotten it. So much so that Every single child here was given one of the graves to tend. And before the Commonwealth War Graves came in with the limestone plinths in the 1920s, the children weeded and put flowers on the graves of the Australians and the Brits. And every child had a grave, had a soldier that they looked after. And there was a, an elderly woman, she must have been ancient, she walked up to me in Vinicor when we showed our documentary in the town. It's funny, actually. We only expected 100 people to turn up. Thousands of people turned up. We had to do multiple sessions. But one of them was this lovely old lady who was sort of helped up on sticks by his son. And she came and she held my hand. And she said, I was one of these children. I was one of these children. And so they all sit there in that grave. And um, to this day, you can go to Vinyakor. And whilst there's no longer those, those old-fashioned graves, what there is 
is there is now a Museum des Australiens, a Musée des Australiens, which has all of these images, and hopefully maybe one of George's pictures, um, on display. And the lovely thing about it is if you rock up at the right time, maybe during the school holidays in France, all the kids there have memorized the story of an individual soldier, Jim Holland and Angus Wilson. And they'll come up and they'll take you and they'll tell you the story of their Australian. And you know why? Because they've never, ever forgotten the Australian. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce my, my great friend and uh, a wonderful artist by the name of George Petru, who's done these beautiful pictures all around the room. He wants to say a few words. And um, please give him a hand. Thank you, Ross, for another magnificent presentation. It's wonderful. A real pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. Happy you all enjoyed that. Um, just before I sort of, I'd like to say thank you to Findex for putting this whole magnificent sort of a travelling show around Australia together. So thank you, Terry and Spiro. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a wonderful journey. And to the organisers, uh, Laura and Jenny, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, Ross, Ross has been so patient about the whole thing, and I really do need to thank him sincerely. This is the third show he's done for us. He was good enough to come down to Melbourne to launch the first show for us, so that was um, greatly appreciated, and uh, thank you. Um, also, tonight we have a sort of special um, little section where we will introduce these wonderful uh, recipients of the Cross of Valor Medal. So we'll do that shortly. So thank you for making these chaps have come from virtually every state of Australia to be here tonight. So it's a, it's a magnificent effort. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's all I sort of want to set the stage. I just want to ask you a few questions, George, because I don't want to let you get away that easily. Okay. okay. Why did you want to paint these pictures? What was it about these images that got you so excited? Well, I'm always fascinated to know why people why people respond the way they do. Well, um, I guess it's the magnificent story, and it's probably your magnificent book. <laughs> um, yeah. Read that book a couple of times, and the stories were just so amazing. You just, just, you know, just drew me. Uh, when I first saw the photos at the uh, War Memorial back in 2012, they were so amazing. The impact was most goosebumps. Just sort of, you know. Do you agree with what I was saying? Though, mm. That the um, the response from so many people, you're taken back by the emotion that they are around. Oh, oh, look, I know, I get emotional every time I talk about it. Yeah, so do I, I always cry. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a bit like that, so I'm a bit, bit of a sookie as well. But the stories are amazing. I mean, you read that these guys, so you mentioned Angus Wilson. I mean, he doesn't live too far away from where we live in Williamstown. And I guess the story of Tiny Saloon, the chap over here, the one in the middle here, um, his story is quite amazing. And Tell me, I mean, I'm really fascinated with your picture sure. of General Sir John Monash. Yes. I mean, I've got a real pain in my bonnet about Monash. You know the Nazis used the Blitzkrieg in World War Two. How many of you know who developed the Blitzkrieg? How many? Monash. How many of you ever read that in an English history book? Mm. It's not acknowledged, but basically the breakthrough of World War One, the definitive change in strategy that stopped young men being pushed across the battlefield in the face of machine gun fire and relentless artillery fire, was this chap, an Australian called John Monash. And he, he conceived what the Germans eventually adopted to invade France again in the 1940s, um, the Blitzkrieg, which was just an overwhelming use of combination of air power, tanks and artillery. And it was a completely revolutionary way of fighting a war. And it saved lives and it won the war. So I, don't, I don't think he gets enough credit for what yeah. he did. Um, he's not part of the Vignu Corps collection, I should actually say. Um, I'm just a huge fan of, uh, of General Monash's and... Having read a couple of books about him, I'm, I'm just in awe of him, and uh, and just does not get enough recognition. So, simple that might, sure. you tend to agree with me on on that Absolutely, score. Yeah. Uh, he was he was amazing. Um, but I was just going back to uh, there was a number of things that sort of occurred that sort of inspired me to sort of another reason, I guess. Um, while we we're doing the paintings, we noticed that Tiny Saloon lived in Richmond, which is once again not far from where we live, and then. Uh, finding out he lived in Hyde Street, which is not far from where we live. I sort of seem to drive down that road quite often. I sort of noticed the number of the house is 376 Hyde Street. And um, I sort of Googled it that night. And um, 
looked at it and I said, my God, that's where my wife's brother lives. He, he lives in the same house. And we sort of, we were sort of just blown away by that sheer coincidence. Then we found out it was actually the house next door. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Close enough is good enough. But it's still, it's still right. I'll now ask um, Spiro, do you want to say a few words to say to Will? I do. Thank you so much. Um, it, it renders you speechless, doesn't it? All of that. It's the cult of Bella here right behind me. To, I don't know how I joined that club, but it'd be amazing if I could. But uh, all amazing stories. Look, uh, uh, George's story is amazing. And that's how we kind of got involved here. My brother Terry, who's over there, chairman of Findex, was himself involved in a Gallipoli fundraiser to raise a statue in honour of Anzac nurses who everybody forgets about, right? So that statue was, has now been commemorated in Melbourne and Port Melbourne, actually. Life-size bronze statue, uh, yeah, a significant um, fundraising effort. And through that, he met George, and here we are tonight, uh, honouring all of these people and these stories, and Anne Ross's story of a labour of love, a, an obsessive desire to name everybody in those photos. And I, I dare say that's going to be a lifelong uh, journey for the Ross to do that because he's not going to let go, is he, as, as, as is, we know. Uh, a very impressive body of work from everybody here and George for bringing all of those images to life for us to visualise and have some feeling for what they experience. He's brought them to life, just like George has. He's brought them to life. Those stories uh, resonate with us all, and certainly did with me. I mean, they're very emotional, and you can you can tell that he does it because it's something that he wants to achieve to make sure that we're aware of what actually happened over there 100 years ago. So, Ross, congratulations and thank you so much for sharing your long journey with us. It's really very much appreciated. Also, just add to that, as a token of my appreciation, Ross, there's a little present here for you. Um, I hope it's one of your favourites. It's certainly one of mine. So um, I'll just open it up there. I've been trying hits for months. <laughs> oh, beautiful. so honoured to accept this beautiful gift from George Petrie. It's a magnificent rendition of the sad-eyed digger. George Gordon Gordon. It's one of my dreams to bring this young man back together with his living family. Those eyes, you've captured them so well, George. He, he shows all the trauma of what he did. He was a young signalman. His job was to clamber out on the battlefield in often pitch darkness and to dig trenches for the wires that were used to communicate back to the command HQ. And it was done at great hazard, huge risk, and the constant threat of shell fire and machine gun fire. And we know that George was basically killed by artillery fire. He and another guy were killed instantaneously by shell fire. And the tragedy is the reason why I want to re reunite him with his family is because he had no family here in Australia. They were all back home in England. And they probably never saw their son again. They probably never saw the image that we get to see in the Lost Dinners images. And it would be a wonderful thing to bring a family back together with the boy they lost. Thank you, George, for making that possible. Best wishes, mate. Thanks for making this adventure happen. Now, the show has been an extraordinary experience. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands, and the events uh, in northern France were just a short distance away, really, in Australian terms, where I grew up. I grew up in the Second World War, so war is something that's very real to me. 
the way in which these remarkable people have put this outstanding effort together with journalism, art, finance, entrepreneurship is, is utterly moving because it so characterizes what a reason to I. I love to be in this country and be part of it. It's the generosity of spirit and the courage of the people and the complete independence of thinking for the good. It's been a privilege. I'm a friend of George and I call it an honor to be a friend of his. And I thank them all. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's really important to have these images recorded and, and to have the extra interpretation that George has given to the photographs through the paintings is fantastic. And I can see from looking at the photographs that he has felt what's coming through from those men in the photographs. And I'm really enjoying seeing the paintings. So thank you, George. That's great. I find it quite emotional when you see it and the work of George is just amazing. I find his work is just unbelievable. It's the, looking at their faces and the eyes are just incredible. It's just been a wonderful experience coming here and seeing it all and meeting the people that are involved with it all. Witnessing uh, the, um, the art tonight uh, gives you a, uh, a sense of um, awe in what these people are actually experienced and I imagine someone like me could, could never um, imagine what these people went through but tonight it seems to have sort of brought it out for the evening. So this is such an incredible exhibition to see. It's really amazing what George has done in bringing to life these lost soldiers who had been lost for over well, nearly a hundred years. This one's an unknown soldier and I feel, I get really emotional sort of just thinking, oh my God, I want him to find his family. So it's, it's incredible and I hope he does find his family one day. So. Go. The artwork's absolutely incredible, the way that the art has come to life, the photos that were discovered by Ross, which was um, back in Vineyard 4, the way that Dad has been able to portray that and bring the photos to life is absolutely incredible. Each, each digger tells a story and you can, you can see that in his eyes. Um, it's an incredible, incredible journey that, um, that both George and Ross have gone through. And I, and I believe this exhibition really portrays that and, and something that's very unique and very special to so many people around Australia, not only those that are here tonight, uh, but also to the families um, that had their relatives fight um, in the war to, to, to get us to where we are today. I think it's very, very special. Fantastic work. Paid all of my dues, so I picked up my shoes and got up and walked away. Oh, I was just a boy, giving it all away. I worked hard and failed, now all I can say is I threw it all away. Oh, I was just a boy, giving it all away. Sail away, sail away Ooh, well I know better now I know better now I've given it all away
out in the world Too much for my nerves Well, only myself to blame See, I was just a boy And there was nobody else to blame I've done all I can now It's out of my hands Stand on my head and say Ooh, I was just a boy Giving it all away Sail away Yeah, sail away Gonna give it all away. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I know better now. I know better now. I ain't gonna give it all away. Oh, 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 oh. I know better now. I know better now. Giving it all away. Just a boy, I'm giving it all away. Yeah, I was just a boy, I'm giving it all away. See, I was just a boy, I'm giving it all away. I was just a boy. I was just a boy. I was just a boy.